Welcome everyone. My name is David Wood and I chair London Futurists. Technology changes society. Technology changes humanity. It changes how we work, rest and play. It changes how we learn things, how we keep ourselves healthy. Technology changes how we find intimate partners, how we make babies, how we grow old and how we die or possibly delay our deaths. But what is the pace at which technology changes? And what is the pace at which technology changes society and humanity? One view is it's relatively constant pace, sometimes faster, sometimes slower. And some people say that actually the biggest impacts are in the past, that the inventions of things like the washing machine probably will do more for humanity than any other invention. There's another view, quite common in futurist circles, which is that the pace of change is increasing and increasing relatively steadily on what people call an exponential curve. I'm not sure about either of these views. I share the view of today's speaker, Michael Baxter, that things are more complicated, that the pace of change is mixed. Sometimes there are slowdowns, sometimes there are speed ups. In fact, speed up isn't quite the right word. And as you'll hear from the speaker, we see jerks, sometimes positive jerks, sometimes negative jerks. We're gonna be looking at some of the history of these jerks and looking forward to what might be happening in the not too distant future. And it is my view that if we have a naive view of history, a naive view of economics, a naive view of politics, we will be badly positioned to steer the new impacts of technology as they come to place. So today's speaker is Michael Baxter. He is a technology and economics journalist. He is also a writer. He is the author most recently of the book, which has inspired today's event, Living in the Age of the Jerk. Michael's gonna speak for about 15 minutes or so, sharing some ideas from his uh, book, and then I'm gonna ask him some questions, and then we're gonna open it up into a much wider discussion, when I will be guided by the questions that the audience places in the Q&A window, and the questions which have been most upvoted by the group intelligence here. Michael Baxter, welcome to London Futurists, over to you. Thank you very much for having me. There's two things I really wanted to chat to you guys today about. Um, Living in the Age of the Jerk is a book that I've been working on for the last couple of years, really, two and a half years, I suppose. And Techopia is an online magazine that I'm launching in January. Um, and I'll explain more. So I, I, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about me. Um, I'm an economics and technology writer. Uh, in recent years, I was the editor of a publication called Information Age, which some of you might be familiar with for a couple of years. And over the last 10, 15 years or so, in addition to writing about the economy, I've been an economic spokesman for a couple of companies as well. Um, go way back in the early days of my adulthood, I worked in the computer games industry. I was a co-founder of a tech company that got listed on the NASDAQ a long time ago. I did an internet publishing venture in the late 1990s, which cost me a lot of money, by the way. More recently, I did a daily email newsletter called Investment in Business News. I say more recently. Um, I've actually been a freelance journalist, <laughs> occasional editor and author for the last 10 years or so. Um, in two th I'm not sure if it was 2013 or 2014, but um, I wrote or co-wrote a book called I Disrupted a few years ago. And I like to think I Disrupted was quite um, prophetic and it was about disruptive technology. The other day, The Economist ran a big article about the future of the oil industry and has it got a future? And we kind of wrote about things like that in the book many, many years ago. And, you know, we went big on the hollowing out of the middle class, echo chambers, etc. Stuff that everyone's talking about now, but I don't think necessarily they were talking about it then. And the reason why I've got a picture of a car in this um, um, slide is because I think this is a really interesting story. So when I was working on I Disrupted, I looked into the possibility that one day we might be able to 3D print a car. And I spoke to 
experts on 3D printing. I even spoke to someone who won an award for a project looking at the possibility of 3D printing cars. And without one exception, everybody told me that it was ridiculous. I actually felt a little embarrassed because they were so disparaging about the idea that we would ever be able to 3D print a car. And of course, we do 3D print cars now. It is possible. There's an example of one here. And that's just happened in such a short period of time. I was, I was kind of looking to some distant future, sort of in the end of this decade or something like this. I had no idea it was going to happen that soon. And this is a familiar story to me. I find that people are very disparaging about how technology is going to change. And one of, and there are many reasons for that and I'll come to those reasons in a moment but one of the reasons I, I think is because people don't naturally seem to grasp what exponential means or or what learning rates mean so the um, International Energy Agency for example has completely totally and utterly failed to project the market share that renewables will have every year since 2010 every year it updates its projections because the years before were too cautious and they're wrong again and um, I suppose in a way, COVID is a quite a good example of that. I think in the early days of COVID, people were very dismissive of it because there were such few cases. But as most people in, the, in this seminar will understand, ex exponential has a significance. And I kind of feel people are making the same mistakes now as well. So what's a jerk? So somebody told me, I this is a new one on me, but apparently jerk has another meaning. I don't know what this other meaning is, but the meaning that I'm thinking about is it's the derivative of acceleration. It's when something is accelerating and it accelerates some more. Um, and this is the formula f f for a jerk. Uh, and if you're interested, the derivative of a jerk is called a snap and the derivative of a snap is called a, uh, a crackle. And the derivative of a crackle, as you probably guessed, is called a pop. So it's a uh, jerk, snap, crackle and pop. So, so, so I've done this sort of sh short animation to explain um, what a jerk is in the context of evolution. So life began about 4 billion years ago. And frankly, for for, for about a billion years, the pace of change was quite slow. Um, when photosynthesis emerged, it was actually a negative jerk. Things went into sharp reverse, and then we saw a pickup in pace. About 1.8 billion years ago, we, had, we saw an event known as singular endosymbiosis, when we had the first complex organism. It's a theory, no, it's not actually certain that that's what happened. That seems to be the, the most popular theory at the moment. And we saw a pickup in the pace of evolution. And then of course, about half a billion years ago, we had the Cambrian explosion. Um, and with that, we saw a much more rapid change in evolution. Um, when we had the dinosaurs and the meteorite work them out, of course, there was a negative jerk. And then after this, we had this extraordinary um, acceleration in the pace of evolution. And in the book, we look at five different industrial revolutions. Now, it's just semantics. <laughs> you, you can argue about whether or not they're the right word terminology that we've used, and you could argue, argue that they're not as distinct as we say. But you have to draw a line somewhere. And the first industrial revolution occurred roughly 1760 to 1820, and it was, it was certainly a revolution that I did at O-level at school, which was um, a revolution in the textile industries, steam engine, um, and early days of steel. The second industrial revolution was circa 1865 to 1914, and it was the big one. It was the biggest one we've had so far. It saw the mass use of electricity. It, it saw the television, it saw the motor car, it saw the airplane, it saw the telephone, it saw, saw rubber tires. It was, it, was it was a very profound period of change indeed. We had to wait quite a long time for the next one, which a lot of people refer to as the third industrial revolution, the IT revolution, which I'd put at the sort of 90s, at the at sort of the, the late 80s or the 90s really, uh, maybe early 2000s. The fourth industrial revolution is, is underway and it's, um, I suppose you could call it an information age. It's about data and AI. And for me, the big one, something that will be even more significant, in fact, significantly more significant um, than the second industrial revolution is what myself and my co-author Julian de Salabri call the fifth industrial revolution. And 
The fifth industrial revolution overlaps with the fourth. In fact, I think they've both begun. And the first in fifth industrial revolution product, in my opinion, was this. It was the smartphone. Because the smartphone, I think, has augmented us um, for good or for ill. It has augmented us. It's changed us. And I think we're going to see other technologies emerge over the next decade or two that will augment us to a much greater extent, such as gene editing CRISPR-Cas9, such as uh, wearable technology that's going to be kind of on us all the time, that we will view the screen through an augmented reality screen. We will have a little AI advisor with us all the time that will be able to remind us of stuff, remind us of people whom we bu- whom we've just bumped into and we can't remember who they are. And um, uh, and, and of course, the sort of the Neuralink type brain interface type stuff, which is pretty phenomenal, really. Um, this is a graph that I find fascinating, and I do touch upon this at the beginning of the book, and I just want to just talk about it just for a moment. Now, I've I've done a lot of economics. I did economics at university, and I've written about economics a lot. I've worked for a lot of companies. Um, Um, focusing on the economy, but I find it fascinating that economic growth per capita was not a thing until after the first industrial revolution had finished. Um, I think there was a slight pickup during the um, 18th century, but it really got underway from around about 1820. Um, It's not really a surprise, is it? I mean, it's pretty obvious why that is the case, but I think it's good to see hard data supporting what is intuitively obvious. But what I find fascinating is the fact that there was such a time lag, such a long delay between the second industrial revolution, the greatest industrial revolution we've ever had, and what was the golden age of economic growth in the West, which was 1950 to 1973 in Europe, started a little earlier in the US. Now, Unfortunately, I've got a bit of a confession for you here. Unfortunately, I'm very, very, very sad to inform you, but that I'm old enough to have voted in the first general election when Margaret Thatcher was elected. And when Margaret Thatcher was elected, of course, there was a big debate about why was the economy doing so badly. Now, I must admit, I've changed my mind about Thatcher and whether she was good or bad about five times since then. Um, but But in recent years, I've begun to understand the role of technology in all of this. And for my money, there is no surprise that the economy slowed down in the mid 1970s. It slowed down because we had finally managed to squeeze all of the low hanging fruit that was created by the second industrial revolution. The the, the, The economic impact of the second industrial revolution was slowed down. It was slowed down by the First World War, the Great Depression, the Second World War. Post Second World War, we have this economic boom and it comes to an end for the simple reason well, the second industrial revolution finished 60, 70 years ago. Of course, it, of course it was going to come to an end. We'd, you, we'd pick the low-hanging fruit. And whenever people talk about the 70s and about the neoliberalism revolution, for me, that was just Flotsam and Jetson. What this was really was a story about technology. Another interesting thing about technology is that when an industrial revolution is in process, we are not necessarily better off. For example, records from the British Army show that the average height of new recruits dated from a period born during a period of the first industrial revolution actually fell. Um, The first industrial revolution made people worse off, of course it changed eventually, but to begin with, it made people worse off. I'll skip over that slide. I can come back to it if anyone wants to talk to me about it. So the question is why? Why is technology changing so fast? And I don't want to go into any detail about this. I can can if you want me to. But I, I, I kind of got six reasons, really. One is sort of one of my favorite things, really, is convergence. Um, ideas built, built upon existing ideas. The kind of exponential learning rates and Moore's law is an example of an exponential rate. Um, the falling cost of renewables or lithium ion batteries or uh, genome sequencing are other examples. Tools. Modern technology are tools. People, some technology cynics say, well, what's the big deal about the internet? You can't cut your hair with it. You can't eat it. Well, you can't eat the printing press either. It's just a tool for achieving other things. And I think I don't know whether this is scary. I think this is possibly scary and 
and exciting. Um, it's the kind of stuff that Gary Kasparov talks about when he says that we have to combine with computers. But for me, digital evolution is something could, that could be very, very profound. Um, there are, there have been, I think there have been two types of evolution up to now. There's the type of evolution that Darwin described. Then when an ape emerged that could talk and memories were passed on from generations, we had a, a second type of evolution, a cultural evolution. And I think with digital technologies, we could be seeing a third type and the implications are slightly difficult to predict. And the other one is that simply technology is going to augment us. It's going to augment us for the better or worse, but in some respects, at least, it will make us more intelligent, more knowledgeable, and that's got to have an impact on the rate of innovation. And I think in history, there have been five great jerks, great jerks since an ape um, stepped off the, the Rift Valley in Africa. And the first of those was speech, and that led to an acceleration. It led, or it didn't actually lead to an acceleration, it led to cultural evolution, which had never existed before. With writing, we saw an acceleration in that. We saw a jerk, which led within a couple of thousand years to the glories of ancient Greece and Rome. Um, the next jerk was the printing press, and the printing press was associated with the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Industrial Revolutions, and of course, um, revolutions as well. There is, certainly there was a connection between the printing, printing press, spreading the words of Martin Luther, who actually said the printing press was a gift of God, um, with the English Civil War and the French Revolution, for example, and the French Russian Revolution by default, because that was partly influenced by the French Revolution. The fourth great change is the internet. I think the internet is up there with the printing press for the impact that it is going to have on society, and indeed already is. And in my view, uh, augmented reality and I should say VR, virtual reality, combined with AI will be just as big a deal as the internet. And what does this mean? Well, in the book, we look at eight different scenarios. And the first of these scenarios is a rather happy scenario. It's a very utopian type scenario. I liken it to Star Trek. Humanity becomes one nice, great, big, happy family. Um, uh, you could call it a global citizen. We live in an age of abundance and we look at things like universal basic income and we look at um, our social skills bec become very, very important. Another slightly more disturbing scenario, or an extremely disturbing scenario, very dystopian, I liken to Star Wars. It's, you see authoritarian leadership and extreme inequality. Third a scenario I liken to the, to the Disney movie Wally, which is that technology makes life a little bit too easy for us and we become very lazy and machines are waiting upon us. The fourth scenario I liken to Matrix and it's fairly obvious what that's all about. Virtual reality becomes um, so much better, more fun than reality. Uh, actually, I, just, I don't know if anyone saw it. I've been watching a TV series on BBC recently called Devs, which I think touches upon that theme, which I thought was great. Then you've got the Orwellian scenario, and I don't think I need to explain what that one's about. We all know about privacy. And I'm sure a lot of people have watched The Social Dilemma on Net Netflix. The sixth scenario I call the $6 million man scenario, but I actually see this as being not so much augmenting us physically, technology might do that, but augmenting us mentally as well. Um, and I think that's going to be an extremely profound significance. The seventh scenario is a kind of Terminator slash conflict scenario. I don't know that I think that Arnold, an, an Arnold Schwarzenegger is going to appear naked in our midst from the future. I don't think, think a war with, with intelligent machines is, is a realistic fear for the next few decades. Um, maybe, maybe it could be later this century, I don't know. But, but, but the, the possibility that technology and the rapid pace of technology could lead to conflict, maybe global conflict or, or civil war and revolutions, I think is very real. And the final scenario is what I call a Gaia scenario, which is when technology kind of unites us and it, you create a kind of emergent system, not so much sort of thinking of as one. Um, Isaac Asimov hit upon a similar concept in his foundation series when he talked about Gaia, which was a, a planet which thought as one, or, or in a movie like Avatar with the one tree. So one of the key themes of the book is join the debate. I think that this topic, and we touch upon climate change in the book as well, but it's, it's not a book about climate change. They're too important 
to leave to the elites at Dav that go to Davos. They're impo too important to leave to entrepreneurs. They're too important to leave to uh, the government. We all have to take a degree of responsibility. Uh, we all have to join this debate. We all have to enter into discussions um, on social media down the pub. And I think we all have to become aware of these issues because actually, uh, although the crowds can get it horrendously wrong, I am actually a believer in madness of the crowds. But, you know, I'm going to quote from you from a band that I used to love when I was a kid. Um, now they're planning the crime of the century. Who are these men of lust, greed and glory? Rip off their masks and let's see. But that's not right. Oh no, what's the story? For there's you and there's me. And I think that we can become very judgmental in this internet age and be highly critical of others. But you know what? Every single one of us are biased creatures and, every sing and there is a certain amount of evidence indeed that extremely well-educated people can be the most biased ones of the lot because they know so much about bias that they convince, every they convince everybody else is biased. And on the theme of joining the debate, there's a quote that some of you might be familiar with. Um, first they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me and there's no one left to speak for me. And I think that the impact that technology is going to have over the next... In, what in the book we describe as the lifetime as most readers of the book is going to be fantastically profound and it could create you utopia or it could create dystopia which is why in the new year we're we're going to be launching an online publication to look at those ideas because we want people to join the debate thank you many thanks uh, michael lots to think about there i'll let you remove your screen that's great have I done it? You have done it. Good. You see, I can, I can write about technology, but I'm not very good at applying it. So one uh, little theme from the feedback is that uh, your microphone is quite close to your mouth. Was I a bit muffly? Not so much muffly. It's when you, we get excited, we sometimes uh, have explosives coming out. Anyway, so let's, uh, let's tweak that. Right. Well, I've moved it. I've moved Fantastic, it. yes. Uh, I'll try not to get too excited. No, no, no. We're going to uh, look at the questions from the audience shortly. People may want to take some time to think uh, what question is a good one. I'll give you a tip. If you write a short question, it's more likely to be upvoted. And uh, we might uh, look back at the slide that you skipped because uh, that uh, may be. so at the right time you can share that one again. Uh, or I could I could talk you through it because I, really, I I you know it's not it's not a complicated slide. Yeah. But so. so what about the view that all of this stuff is hype? What about the view okay. that uh, this stuff isn't real? Uh, there are some comments on the three D printing of cars, for example. Mm. One person backs you up, uh, uh, Peter Jackson says, yeah, we are uh, uh, 3D printing rocket engines. Dean Bubbly says, well, isn't it just the chassis of the car that's being uh, 3D printed? What about the engine of the car and what about the electronics? Are we getting overexcited too quickly here? Well, that's a fair comment. But, but I think the point is that when I looked at it not that many years ago, I couldn't find anyone that thought it was a realistic proposition not a single person. And they didn't say, oh yeah, you could 3D print the chass chassis, but not the engine. They didn't say that. They just said, no, you can't do it. You'll never be able to do it. Don't be so ridiculous. I'm not predicting in the book that all cars are going to be 3D printed in the next six weeks. You know, it's not going to happen next Tuesday. In fact, we don't talk that much about 3D printing in the book at all as it happens. But I, I, I saw that as, a, as, as an example, really, for like a metaphor to explain how People are quite dismissive of those things. And within a very sh relatively short period of time, I think they're proven wrong. The enemy of living in the age of the jerk, if you like, is an economist from um, Northwestern University in the United States near Chicago, or I think it is in Chicago, called Robert Gordon. And um, I kind of devote a chapter to, to technology cynicism. And B Bill Gates says has famously said, we overestimate how quickly technology will change, but we underestimate its significance when it happens. And if you think about how things change exponentially, that kind of fits in with that, because that's how exponential works. When something changes exponentially, as we saw with COVID to begin with, oh, it's not happening very quickly. Oh, I don't, I don't believe it. I don't think it is going to happen. And then it starts happening at a, at a, at a terrifying rate. 
Um, and in the book, you know, we, we drill down and we look at the di various different you know, factors at play. And I think one of the, th one of the things that technology, sorry, I hope that makes too much noise, um, cynics overlook is convergence. Um, one of my favorite stories about convergence relates to a uh, musician in the 1930s called Robert Johnson, who supposedly um, met the devil on um, Highway 49 and 61 in Clarksdale, Mississippi. And the devil um, made, get, did a deal with him. He said, I will make you the greatest guitarist that will ever be, but in return, I want your soul. And of course, um, and that's how rock and roll was invented, according to the story. But in fact, the real story of how rock and roll was invented was because you had two very different cultures converged. You had um, an African musical convergence, a culture with a background in, in rhythm, and a European um, musical tradition, which is more about mathematical precision, and they came together, and that's how you had rock and roll. And I think that says a really good metaphor. And you look at technology, you look at various technologies that have developed over the last few years. Quite often, they were developed for another purpose. And then all of a sudden, oh, well, they're applicable to this market as well. The other thing I'd say to you is that, and this is really the lesson, I think this is the lesson of the iPhone. Um, not so many years before Apple launched the iPhone, Apple was a troubled company. Uh, back in 1997, um, Bill, uh, Steve Jobs was drafted back in, but it really was a company on its knees. There was even press talk. Some people were saying, is Apple going to survive much longer? And what happened circa 2007, 2008, is the conditions suddenly came into place in which a smartphone was possible. Things like Moore's, Moore, Moore's Law made computers of a sufficient power. Things like the commoditization of components. Things like wireless internet access. And all of a sudden, a smartphone was possible. And Apple went from an incredibly short period of time, from being a company that was really struggling to survive, to the first company in history worth $2 trillion. $2 trillion. And um, certainly the first tech company in history worth $2 trillion. And for me, when technology changes like that, it doesn't happen suddenly. It's not gradual. It's not, um, you, it jerks. And, it, and that change happens very, very suddenly. And if we just sit back and say, I don't believe it, if we're not careful, we're going to miss it. And then it will be too late. And then, and then we might find we can't do anything about it. And look at what's happening at the moment with social media and echo chambers and, and some of the, quite frankly, terrifyingly, or very sad debates I see on social media, which which are leading to so many conspiracy theories. Um, that's just one example of something that I think is quite minor compared to what we will be seeing in the next few years. Well, I'm a big fan of seeing things from a convergence point of view as well. And as you pointed out, the iPhone was successful because Apple was able to use brilliant engineering and also shrewd marketing to bring together various things that were possible not so well previously, but which came together very nicely, including an excellent web browser. As you pointed out, there was a increasingly ubiquitous Wi-Fi. They put in a different kind of screen that wasn't possible before. And yeah. they also took advantage of something they'd built up over a number of years previously, the iTunes infrastructure, that more and more people had uh, developed an iPod and Absolutely. then they got this but, uh, network. But, but the iPod wouldn't have been possible a few years before it, you know, the, the, the iPod wouldn't have been possible in 1999, I don't believe. Right. So let's talk uh, about... Just, can we, on the subject of convergence, can I just mention one other example? Um, virtual reality. Because I happened to Google that I, I used to work in the computer games industry many moons ago. So virtual reality was something I had an interest in. And I Google virtual reality when I was researching I disrupted because I and something came up and it's and it was the, and it was number one position on Google and it was called the virtual reality forum. And it said innovations have slowed in recent years and progress has not exactly been recent. So a forum that was existed purely for the purpose of promoting virtual reality as a medium had pretty much given up on it. And about nine months after that, Lucky Palmer sold Oculus Rift to Facebook for $2 billion. And all of a sudden virtual reality became one of the most hotly discussed things there were. And I believe that what 
that forum missed was convergence because Lucky Palmer had seen how a lot of the technology in a smartphone, for example, could be used in a virtual reality headset. And of course, um, the virtual reality forum wasn't looking at smartphones. Sorry. Ask so question. it's a technology coming in from uh, another field. It was developed and matured in one place, and then suddenly it could switch over. Into exactly, a new exactly right. And I think a lot of technology cynics say not looking at the big picture. They're not looking at how there are multiple industries in which technology is changing exponentially or a learning rate. And when those technologies converge, um, dramatic things happen. One more question for me to kick off with, and then mm -hmm. I will take the top voted questions from the Q&A. Just a, a note to the audience, if you like a question there, you can hover your mouse over the thumb and you can click it up. Michael, you mentioned this quote from Martin Niemöller, that yeah. they might come. Mm. Who are the they in this scenario? Who are the they who might uh, pick us off one by one unless we are having a proper debate and a proper collaboration? I have been quite depressed over the last few years about what I see as being distinct authoritarian type moves that are occurring. Um, and there are obvious examples in countries around the world, but you know, I think at closer to home as well. Um, ironically, with um, COVID, um, people whose views I might not necessarily agree with um, have been making similar arguments, but from a completely different context, which is that they think that COVID is conspiracy theory and that it's all about them controlling us. And, and I totally don't agree with that because I don't believe in conspiracy theories. I believe that individuals, um, that crowds can make um, bad decisions um, and that indiv sometimes individuals can make it decisions which from their point of view seem the right decision but when you multiply it out across the crowd it can be self-destructive and history tells us that in the past certain conditions have led to authoritarianism and those conditions start with a, um, a period in which um, GDP per capita or average wages fall um, an, a period in which there's a backlash against immigration, um, a period in which people look, in, in which there's, 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 there's rapid change and a lot of people feel missed out from that change and they look for people to blame. And I don't think there is a they, I don't think there is an individual, I don't think there's a person sitting um, somewhere stroking a cat, planning all of this. Um, what you do have is populist politicians who look at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the the sense what people are thinking and they ride that tide and I think we've seen disturbing signs in recent years and my, my fear is that in future years they'll become worse because of the in, of the changes that technology is going to create. Let's take a question from uh, Margaret Hardy, the top voted question. It's quite a long one but it's I'll read okay. it out. What makes you think that we will share one of these futures uh, we, as, as humanity? Yeah. Convergence is a powerful idea, hmm. but there are different attitudes to technology in different parts of the world. And isn't the world already on different tracks due to differences in ideologies, political systems, cultures, social attitudes? So US, Sweden, Iran, China, North Korea, India, Afghanistan, and South Africa, will they really share a common future? Or will the countries of our world accelerate on a multi-track to their own versions of possibly dystopia? Okay. Well, the first point, and I should have said to this, I should have, I should have emphasized this point when I looked through the eight scenarios. I'm not saying, we're not saying that, but we're going to have one of those scenarios and none of the others. They're not mutually exclusive. Uh, we could have bits of all of them. Um, um, what I think we need to do is trying to, do what we can to create the most as much of the benign outcomes as possible um, one of the reasons why i believe in the concept of sort of humanity getting closer together is partly because is because of the combination of augmented reality and real-time language translation so i think when we're in a position in which you don't have conversations with people like zoom calls like we're doing now uh, we're talking hologram to hologram you can have lunch with anybody 
you like anywhere in the world uh, and and there will be a, a restaurant where they live and there's a restaurant where you live and the restaurants will be have similar menus and you can go and have lunch together and, the, and your holograms will be looking at each other. I think that's going to have a very, very profound impact. And the other thing I think is going to have a very profound impact will be real-time language translation, which is already advancing very, very rapidly. So when you're at a, a position when you can talk to anyone in the world in in not necessarily every language known to man, but, but most languages known to, known to humanity. And that is translated in real time and you hear the translation in an earpiece. I think that's gonna have a very, very profound impact. And I think that for younger people in particular, technology has made them slightly more internationally aware. Um, and, and I find it very, very disturbing G given these technologies that I described, if we go down a route in which countries go down very independent paths with their own ideology, I fear for the implications of that. Because history tells you that when you have different ideologies closely overlapping, you get war. The Second World War is an obvious example of that. The First World War is an example of that. You go back in history, you know, um, upstart Rome emerges in the Mediterranean, Carthage and Rome, they're, they're in each other's turf, they clash, war, war is results. So I find the idea in this, in this age when technology destroys barriers so much that if despite having that, we still have barriers. I find that very distant, very, very scary. And I think we should do what we can for that not to happen. So what's your views on relationships with China, for example? Should we be punitive towards China because of their theft of intellectual property, because of their apparent disregards of human rights in, mm. by, by mm. some uh, accounts? I've spoken to a lot of people who know a lot about China. And opinions are very, very mixed about China. Um, the first thing I'd say to you is that you'd never catch me calling it, calling COVID the China virus. I, I do not sign up to the, the point of view that, that this is all China's fault. If you want to have something to blame for, for viruses, you look at climate change and you look at overpopulation and you look at how the, the animal, the natural kingdom, the human kingdom is coming closer together. Um, I also think that the world needs China. I think that, for example, um, China um, is the world leader in developing renewable energies. And we need that technology in order to fight climate change. If we were to turn around and say, well, we don't want China to be a part of this, then I think we are fools to ourselves. Now, there are aspects of China which I find abhorrent, especially the way they've been treating uh, minority groups in certain regions of China, in particular the Muslim uh, population. And, you know, I find that very, very disturbing. But who are we to criticise? You know, uh, Britain um, wasn't that long ago. If, I don't know if it was in my lifetime, but it was certainly soon, not that long before I was born. Britain did some pretty bad stuff as well. When, when, when you, when I, and I have spoken to Chinese people about this, and I've spoken to Ang Br Europeans who live in China, and they get very upset when you talk about the human rights in China because they say, um, "But what about the human? What about the stuff that you've done in the West?" They accuse us of being hypocritical, and I think the other issue is that it is very. I think it's very presumption, very arrogant of us to turn around and say we know what's best for the Chinese people because when you speak to Chinese people and talk about human rights you talk to extremely educated people who um, many of you maybe have a PhD or something and they get very upset about that they said don't lecture us about human rights so I think that we have to be careful when we um, when we start getting on a high horse about China yeah, I worry about the human rights. Yeah, I worry about their attitude to privacy. But I don't think the answer to that is to is to ignore China, is to put them a box and say that's China over there. Um, I think the, the the more intertwined cultures are, the more cultures mix, the more you over the more you overcome problems like that. And as you point out in your book, there's the angle of the bigger the shared market is, the faster the learning effects. And the one reason the technology improves is because there are, is a bigger a number of products out there and the people innovate and they figure out which innovations work. 
And I also liked what you wrote in your book about comparing possible punitive actions towards China today with what happened after the First World War. The the Treaty of Versailles imposed lots of punitive reparations on the defeated powers after the First World War, which led to arguably a period of stasis. Uh, Whereas after the Second World War with the Marshall Plan, with the support for the defeated powers, other investment, it triggered what you have described as this great uh, leap forwards. Mm. And it wasn't just the Treaty of Versailles, it was uh, the League of Nations, which was, had no, no, no muscle at all. Or there was the, I'm sorry, I, I always get it mixed up. I always have to look at one of those words that I look up and then I forget it 30 minutes later. The, is it the Sarbanes Oxley Tariff Act? Have I got that right? That was later on, perhaps. Yeah, 1930, 1930. But the US passed a Tariff Act, Act which imposed um, tariffs on 20,000 imported goods to the US. So post World War One, the world drew in on itself. It blamed countries and it didn't end well. It did not end well at all. Post World War Two, we learned those lessons. We had Bretton Woods, we had the United Nations, we had um, uh, well we had organized institutions like the EU that, that, that who who existed before then, but it it, it got, became had more mu- more muscle, IMF, the World Bank, um, the World Trade Organization, um, the Marshall Plan. There was a real concerted effort to to take on board the lessons of the First World War, and in recent years, it seemed to me that we've been unlearning those lessons and seriously risk repeating the errors of the 1920s and 30s. So let's move on then to the question of how we can have this better discussion in the future rather Mm. than uh, repeating an angry, divisive, finger pointing uh, uh, history. Indeed, yeah. So Peter Jackson, PNJ, uh, points out that in his question, he noticed that humans tend to have difficulty debating seriously about topics that are perceived as speculative. I mean, how are we actually going to have this debate? And and I I throw in a comment here from Wendy Grossman. She commented when you said we're all going to be talking and having lunch with holograms. She says, Mm. well, we're doing that already and we all hate it. You know, are you really seriously saying that we're getting better at having these conversations? What what, what makes you think the debate's going to be good? I don't think you can compare Zoom with with augmented reality any more than you could compare a computer game on a ZX Spectrum with, uh, with, with, with whatever the latest game is today. Um, what we're talking on at the moment is very primitive technology compared to what we'll have in 10, 15 and 20 years time. Um, the other, sorry, what was, what was your other question? Um, well, how are we actually going oh, to get people to have a serious, jo- yes. Jo- join the debate, yeah. It's, it is a difficult one because sometimes I get very depressed by the quality of the debate that you read, that you see on social media. And sometimes you find yourself getting sucked into it as well. And, and you have to sort of remind yourself, no, 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 don't argue with these people. And to an extent, there has to be a degree of education in this. Um, I think one of the great things that, that one of the most important skills that, that we can learn at school is critical thinking. And I think we're all biased creatures. I have a great deal of time for the views that were expressed by Socrates, who believed that we are all quite ignorant individuals and that, that, that no one really knows that much at all. And, and I do think there's a degree of arrogance out there that, oh, I know the answer. And people find it incredibly difficult to change their mind. But academics are the worst culprits. Governments can be the worst culprits for doing that. And we, you're, you're right, we have to get our act together. Um, but but what we have to do is, is start discussing it. And we, there has to be people who are, um, um, can I say, slightly more thoughtful, have to take a lead. And they have to, they have to energetically promote these ideas. And it's not just about technology. You know, it's climate change as well. And gradually, some discussions will gather momentum. Some discussions will become seen as clearly having a useful uh, analysis, a good content, a, not overblown, not hyped. Indeed. So what are you envisioning for Techopia site that you're creating? Oh, the site. Well, um, 
uh, I mean, I have, I've been working publishing or publishing related areas most of my adult life and I have launched publications before. This one is slightly different because it's fundamentally about something quite sort of altruistic really, which is about, um, about the issues that we've been discussing. One of the things I do want to do is invite qualified people to engage, to, to write articles for Techopia. I'm going to be I want to interview people as well. I am wrestling with the idea. I don't, I'm not expecting Techopia to make a fortune. I'm not expecting it to, to make me rich, but I, but I would like it to be sustainable because it will require a lot of work. So I'm kind of wrestling with that one in my mind at the moment, trying to work out how I'm going to achieve that. Really what I want for Techopia is is partners i suppose who who are on my wavelength and who also believe that this is very important but what we want to do is produce very very good editorial thought-provoking editorial thought-provoking videos thought-provoking podcasts and try and create a debate well i'm sure that quite a few people are listening to this live and others who are listening to it in the recorded version will want to participate in that well please do and they can look me up on linkedin um, and if and I can give you my email address if you prefer. So, and then Margaret Hardy offers a more uh, optimistic note, quoting Professor Brian Cox. She says that in a democracy, having a population that is educated and capable of rational and critical thinking, it's a matter of national and global security. So with the right kind of education, which may come in the schools, but it may come in online resources, such as you and also London Future is creating, can lead to a raising of interest, a lazing of understanding in the population and boost these conversations. Well, and absolutely, 100% with that. And, and I have detected a slightly disturbing trend at the moment, which is I've seen a backlash at the concept of university education. Now, I'm not saying university education is a panacea, far from it, but it's, but it, it, but it, but it's not a, it's a good thing to have. And, and especially if it, can, if, it, if, they, if it can put more emphasis on critical skills. So I've been slightly worried by that trend that we've seen of late. Let's take a question from Alan Bolton. Do you think newly evolving capabilities will be mostly owned and controlled by the very wealthy and powerful, therefore thereby further increasing the wealth and power gaps? Because that's um, one reason people are mm, nervous mm, about technology. Mm, mm. Partly people disbelieve it and hype it. Partly people say, well, if it is going to be more powerful, it's going to be bad news. I'm in two minds about that. I think that the lesson of history is that at the time of the innovation, it often leads to inequality. But the lesson of World War II was that, or reword that, the lesson of the end of the second industrial revolution for the following 60 or 70 years, I think, is that too much inequality is bad for the economy. And I think one of the reasons why, the, and they, they, we've had a very, the, the economy has very, been very weak since 2008, probably since before 2008, actually. Um, indeed, it is before 2008. And I believe inequality is a, is a reason for that. I believe, actually, there is an argument to be said. Paul Krugman, the Nobel Prize winning economist, has said that there is an argument to be made for, say, increasing inequality was a cause of the 2008 financial crash. It's in the interest, not just of poorer people but it's kind of in the interest of society as whole it's in the interest of maximizing wealth not to have too much inequality and i have a little bit of optimism here and it's because of the learning rate i'll take an analogy with this the james bond movies i i think they've stopped doing gadgets in james bond movies now because i think that they've run out of ideas because Tech, tech is, is so sophisticated now that with the exception of socks that turn into guns, you know, th th they're limited, they're running out of ideas now because the markets can actually do it quicker than they can. And in order to develop a technology and hone it and make it as good as you possibly can, you need a mass market because that's how the learning rate 
um, works. So you, you, you see movies about some wealthy guy who's been secretly putting all his money into creating some kind of cure to make him live forever or, or live, and, live until he's 200 or something. But actually, if that's what you want to do, the best way to achieve that is to create a mass market for that kind of technology. I don't think inequality is in the interest of people who are very, very wealthy. However, um, economies can be very stupid and we can get very self-destructive outcomes. And the track record isn't so good. Just because it's in the interest of the, of the economy for the macro world um, not to have too much inequality, that doesn't mean to say it won't happen. And, and, I, and that's one of the scenarios we look at in the book, you know. A couple of anecdotes from me on that, one from Henry Ford and one from Isaac Newton. Mm -hmm. So Henry Ford, the pioneer of automation with his Model T Ford, I think uh, he overnight doubled the salary of many of his workers. And his argument was he wanted people like them to be able to afford to buy the products that they were creating. And uh, by raising their wages, it allowed more of the cars to be bought Absolutely. and driven around and it boosted and created a market. Whereas if they had remained poor, it wouldn't have taken place. Absolutely. And I think we've, I think we, ref I think I referred to that in my previous book, I disrupted. I don't think we've actually mentioned Isaac, um, Henry Ford in um, being the judge, but, but you're absolutely right. It's a perfect example. And I mention Isaac Newton because he's famous as being one of the most influential and successful mathematicians and physicists of mm. all time. Mm. But uh, he only spent a third of his intellectual effort on mathematics. He spent a third of his intellectual effort on alchemy and a third of his intellectual effort in reading the book of Revelations and the book of Daniel and trying to come up with uh, interpretations mm. of history. And he also but, lost yeah. a lot of money out of the South Sea bubble yes, as well. That's right. He? So, I mean, yeah. he was running the Bank of England or something at the same time, or the, 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 the <laughs> Mint. But people say that the reason why he was so successful in maths and physics and so unsuccessful in alchemy and others is that the alchemy and the theology was uh, kept private and hidden. It was not subject to peer review, whereas if you publish something and get it commented, I mean, Newton was a bit slow in publishing his theories of calculus, but eventually it allowed other people to correct and improve. So either, no matter how bright you are. So I'm referring back to your character who's secretly behind the scenes with his cat uh, designing a new technology. It won't work unless it's out there in the market. Absolutely. And, um, uh, and in fact, Isaac Newton once said, you know, where does his ideas come from? I stand on the shoulder of giants. Um, and of course, he wasn't being original when he said that. He'd actually copied that from uh, a French a philosopher called Bernard de Chartres, who said something like, we're like dwarfs on the shoulders of giants. Or, I can't remember what he said now, but, but basically Isaac Newton. But, um, and that's the, the whole idea of convergence of ideas, building upon ideas, and why I am slightly uneasy about patents i'm not i'm not massively anti-patents but i think that they've gone too far and that they they are self-destruct and they, they they've they're actually slowing back innovation and i believe i i understand that the wright brothers um patented their technology up to the hill and and it slowed up the development of um of flight as a result there's a very good book about that uh, promoting somebody else's book <laughs> um, but there it's is collaboration a, isn't it it's indeed, building the community indeed i read it a few years ago and it's called sex business and profits and um, the bad news is i read that book cover to cover and i couldn't for the life of me work out why sex was in the title so i just warn you about that but uh, and that and it was by a guy called terence keely and he looked at those issues and i thought he covered it very well and there's a very good video um it's called everything's a remix by i can't remember the name of the guy who did it and I love it. I've watched that video half a dozen times. So anyone, uh, everything's a remix. I strongly recommend Googling that. Well, Matt Ridley, the writer on innovation and biology, among other things, saying that innovation arises when ideas have sex. Maybe that's where well, the sex well, angle comes in. It's well, the well, finding well, ways to bring insights from multiple diverse sources together, as we're I, trying to do in London Futurists. It's convergence. That's why uh, Khaleesi Targaryen went mad because because she was the offspring of a of a brother and actually that's not, yes she was wasn't she she was the offspring of a brother and a sister um, and that's why she went bad. <laughs> Whereas um, so so you know there's a reason why uh, the natural world doesn't like incest. So convergence and that is why we have sex. I think I I, I absolutely think that's that's correct. 
let's take some more questions. And again, I invite the audience to prioritize the questions you would like us to address. I'm taking the one with the most upvotes by okay. Marcin Kirul. Do you think technology can help us in exponential growth? Or will it rather exponentially grow by itself, leaving us somehow behind? Mm. Do we need to worry about technology becoming incomprehensible? Um, well, I mean, this is a really hot topic, isn't it? I mean, uh, Elon Musk's, I believe the slogan for his Neuralink company, Neuralink company is, um, if you can't join them. Uh, if you can't beat them, uh, if you can't, them. If you can't beat them, I beg your pardon, if you can't beat them, meaning if you can't beat them, you've got to join them. And Gary Kasparov has a very similar idea when he talks about computer plus human is better than computer, but it's better than human. And, and that's the way it's got to be. One of the scenarios in the book is what I call the six million dollar man scenario, technology augments this. And some people find that disturbing. They don't like the idea of that. We've got no choice. Because if we don't let technology augment us, it will replace us. Another question about uh, the viability of an actual discussion with uh, large numbers of people. Mm. Uh, is it really credible? Uh, quoting a question now from Istvan Makarez. Okay. Is, it, is it credible to expect responsibility from the masses? when uh, most people try to avoid responsibility. And maybe this is part of the, one of the futures in which we end up like Wally. -E. You know, we're more interested in being uh, mm. uh, catered for without uh, being challenged. Oh, How I do we avoid it, that scenario? Okay, first point I'd say is that if that's correct, then I despair and I'm quite depressed if that is indeed the case. Um, I do believe there's something in, in wisdom of the crowd. There is evidence to suggest um, that is the case. It goes back from Francis Galton, who did his uh, famous experiment at a livestock fair, when he found out the average, when the, the the crowd were better, more accurate at guessing the weight of an ox than 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 any one individual. And there is a degree of evidence to support that. There is evidence, for example, that a diverse crowd, a diverse crowd of reasonably educated people, will outperform a group of ex of group of um, of experts. Um, and I don't want to get too much into that because I'm not a fan of this. We don't need experts anymore. I don't like that, that, that way of thinking at all. But diverse, one of the answers to the question is how do you create a crowd that, that doesn't throw up unpleasant results and, and crowds have thrown up very unpleasant results in the past is through diversity, um, through racial and sexual diversity and also through giving people an equal weight and I've not discussed this in the book it's just a little idea I'm kicking around in my head but um, I've often wondered whether um, if in due course we start having discussions in virtual reality avatar to avatar how much more effective those discussions might be if the avatars are anonymous um, so you can see that in a business environment. Nobody knows which avatar is the boss. I wouldn't mind betting if you did that, you would get some much better ideas. And, um, and I think ditto for what we're talking about. But, but there has to be, education has to step into, step into this, um, which is why it's not, unfortunately, it's not going to happen straight away, even though we probably need it to. Because education... And, and in fairness, I think education is moving that way, but there's got to be more emphasis on critical thinking. That's in line with quite a few of the comments that people have placed in chat. Right, right. There's a very good TED talk by Margaret Hefferman, uh, which I recommend people look at called Super Chickens. Um, and I would recommend people look at that. Um, and that's super chickens. A, super chickens. It was why, about an, why, why is it well, called it, super it was chickens? An, it was an experiment to um, put the, the most productive chickens together. So all the productive chickens were put to, in, a, in a chicken farm. Or, or the ones who had the farm. best egg laying. Is that, in that sense, productive? Exactly. Probably, possibly mate them with the, with the cocks. I don't, I don't know. And, um, and the experiment completely failed because what they found was that the... Uh, um, well, they didn't so much fail. What they found was that the less productive chickens became more productive and the productive ch chickens became less productive because their success was at the expense of other chickens. It was, then their market effect and goes into more depth into that, looks at that and um, looks at how, how you can overcome those kind of problems and 
you know, diversity um, is one of the main reasons, sexual and racial diversity, probably age diversity as well, actually. So is this diversity stuff perhaps overhyped? I'm going to pivot to a question about a related technology, which is decentralization, blockchain and cryptocurrencies. I and mean, the idea there is that uh, these technologies are no longer dominated by one or two powerful voices. Mm. Instead, it allows the crowd to genuinely exploit its own varied point of view. Mm. So this is a question by Anik Sarkar. And he looks at the convergence of technologies. I mean, he actually is studying Web 3.0, which mm -hmm. I remember people have been forecasting for quite a long time. Is His it? view is that Web 3.0 is going to be transformed by more adoption of cryptocurrencies. Uh, is that the kind of view you've got? And are okay. you an enthusiast generally for decentralized technologies? Right. I'm a, I'm a fan of DLT, but I'm not a fan of cryptocurrencies. Um, and the reason why I'm not a fan of cryptocurrencies is because I think there's fundamentally something flawed about central banks not controlling the money supply. Because I think that if we do approach a, an age of abundance, I think there'll be no economic argument whatsoever against um, central banks printing money to find, fund things like universal basic income. But if, the, if, if we have a cryptocurrency, that wouldn't happen. However, I am a fan of, of DLT. And in, and in many ways, this idea of blockchain this is distributed the ledger but, technology yeah? i beg your pardon absolutely distributed ledger technology is blockchain it's just that blockchain has been given a bad name by bitcoin so people are, so it's had a bit of a, a brand a rebranding and, and some uh, of the distributed ledger technologies don't actually have chains in them no but i mean i've spoken to experts about this and they and they and they tell me that it, for all intents and purposes it's the same thing okay um it's, it's, it serves as a good metaphor really for this idea of uh, join the debate the fact that there is no central authority and i do think that dlt has got potential in some areas i mean one of the areas that i'm quite i think has got potential is in developing countries which is um, to do with property rights because in uh, the, there was a very there's a there's a very good book by Hernando, Hernando de Soto called the mystery of capital and he looks at why do poor countries stay poor and his argument is that it's to do with a poorly defined property rights but b the, the the way those property rights are stored measured no one trusts them so if there was a way of um having a blockchain to store to have a uh, a definitive single source of truth of who owns what um i think that could be a a, a massive positive to the to the developing world uh, and emerging emerging markets um i actually i'm actually very bullish about emerging markets i think technology is going to hand them a massive advantage assuming we don't uh, drown under you know and, and assuming climate change doesn't get in the way of course um in a broader sense yeah of course i mean you know there are there are there are many advantages of blockchain um I wonder whether we will eventually move into a situation in which we own our own data and we will be paid maybe to use our own data. Um, and I have a feeling blockchain or distributed DLT will, will play a role in that. One more skeptical question, perhaps, uh, on uh, are we really going to see jerks forward in technology, particularly in the field of healthcare? This is a question by Tom Seabury, who says, uh, do you actually anticipate examples of jerk forward for health information technology? He's referring to some of the debacle, debacles we've seen recently with the old style spreadsheets uh, running out of space when doing some health management <laughs> in the UK. Oh, that's a bit embarrassing, wasn't it? And uh, various other slow progress at industry events such as HIMSS, which I remember used to attend as well. Which, okay. uh, well, on the subject of um, spreadsheets running out of space, I think the issue there was was going against what we've talked about here which is you know openness i think that i think the uk became very proprietary about how it was going to do um how it was going to manage covid and i think that was the fund one of the fundamental problems they had it should have partnered with with other countries on the uh health healthcare well if you take covid as an example i think we probably are going to have a vaccine next year um and 
and that will be a phenomenal achievement. You know, never in the history of humanity will a vaccine have been developed so quickly. Um, if you look at one of the big threats, of course, a far bigger threat than COVID is this idea of, COVID, of antibiotics losing their effectiveness. And the answer to that is technology. And, and indeed, AI has been turned on that problem. And I think that AI is probably in pole position for coming up with, with, with um, superior, you know, long-term fixes to that particular problem. I think when you look at things like CRISPR-Cas9, the ability to edit DNA, that is as profound as you can imagine. Or when you think of things like quantum computers in not so many years from now, being able to um, trace, track down, the, 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 the map the human body in the most minute detail, or when you start having nanotechnology, um, like you remember that movie, oh, what was it called? I think it was called The Fantastic Voyage. Um, I think it was a 1950s sci-fi when a little submarine was injected into a body and they were, do you, do you know the film I'm talking about? I think I do, yes. Maybe Sophia Loren or Raquel. I think Raquel Welsh was a million years BC, wasn't she? It, was probably, it might have been Raquel Welsh, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, I, I remember a small uh, in, uh, submarine going inside a human body yeah, and preparing it. And yeah. that's been a vision for a long time that uh, people I, would look forward to. We're, never gonna have, we're not going to do that. You know, humans aren't going to be doing that. But I don't see any reason why you couldn't have remote control nanotechnologies doing that. Um, and these, these are profound. These, this is profound stuff. You look at nanotechnology. Um, some of the potential here is, is, is extraordinary. It's extraordinary. And what it's waiting is for those conditions to be in place like they were just before Apple launched the iPhone. And when that happens, I think the impact is going to be absolutely phenomenal. And you only have to look at how um, the technology for finding cures and treatments for cancer has been advancing. And I believe that that is going to accelerate that, that or it's going to jerk. Well, one of the most interesting uh, new treatments for cancer is this immunotherapy, where parts of a patient's own immune system is uh, jacked forward. So we can say, or at least it's uh, programmed uh, to make it uh, stronger and injected back into the person's body, and they can fight off a various the cancers of uh, liquids. Uh, can't yet do it with all cancers by all means, but it's a combination of multiple Absolutely. techniques. And another one is um, using gold. Uh, nanoparticles, which I believe has been, been a while since I looked at this technology. I'm not sure how it's developing, but when someone has cancer and you know they're subjected to radiation, and it's and obviously it creates very nasty effects. And what the gold nanotubes do is they act as a magnet, and so they they so if you can insert them into the cells that are infected with cancer, they pull the radiation to those cells, so they don't damage the cells surrounding them so much, which means you can um, hit them with much higher levels of radiation. So that's, yeah, that's, that's incredibly exciting technology. So we're starting to wind up now, just time for maybe a small number of additional questions. I want to come to some of the really tough, uh, tough and important ones. Oh dear. In terms of a, <laughs> well, here's a question from Alan Bolton, yeah. who asks about uh, resourcing. Uh, one thing that can slow down exponential growth Mm -hmm. The kind of thing that we've been talking about is resource starvation. In other words, there aren't enough resources doing this efficiently important long-term work. Is society resourcing appropriately in terms of where effort is being put, uh, health, education, uh, as opposed to military tech, for example? Well, I mean, you know, I'd, I'd much prefer it if the money that was spent on military was spent on something else. Although, although of course, a lot of innovations have been a side effect of spending on, on military. Um, the internet, for example. If you take one example, renewable energies, um, they're now reaching a point where they no longer need subsidies for them to be successful. They're on a learning, they're on a learning rate. Um, I think that companies, you know, money is being invested in AI, regardless. Money is being invested in nanotechnology, regardless. I have a, a controversial view here. A lot of people disagree with me about this. And it is, it is a, a 20 year off thing and it needs a huge amount of money invested in it. But I, one of the technologies which I think is profoundly exciting um, is cultured meat. 
And I know a lot of people disagree with that uh, because at the moment, technology is just not there. Um, but for me, if we can get that right, the, imp the, the implications are so profound because the main agriculture, as you, as you know, is one of the main causes of climate change. Um, the methane that's emitted by cattle is a part of the problem. The real problem is the land that they take up. If that land that was, that was used for grazing was, was handed over, handed back to the wilderness, was handed back to nature, you go a long way to solving climate change. And if you can develop um, cultured meat and it can cross to meat, can full, follow a learning rate, then in 10, 20 years time, no, not 10 years time, 20 years time, you could find that meat is considerably cheaper than it is today. Um, providing you have convergence with other technologies. And, but at the moment, um, there's no low hanging fruit. There's no application for, for cultured meat at all. The only application I could possibly think of would be for astronauts. Um, and that means it's incumbent upon governments to invest a lot of money at that. And I think if they were to do so, I think in the long run, it, could, it would be a major, major strike in favour of winning the war against climate change. And I think it would help reduce poverty. But that does need a significant investment. So perhaps do, public subsidies should be applied to reduce the costs? They need, of, they, they need more than subsidies. They need, they, that needs to be a full-blown moon, sh you know, moon, polo, polo landings, moonshot type thing. And the other thing that we have to do is experiment because you never know what's going to work and what's not going to work. And um, not all of those experiments are going to be commercially viable straight away. So there does need to be significant money thrown at these, at these things. Like was thrown at the um, Human Genome Project, for example, at the beginning of the century or the end of the 90s. Francis Nuchel asks, is there really anything new in what you're saying? And you paint eight scenarios, mm -hmm. uh, which are all interesting, but they're all sort of uh, familiar. And we've been talking about the possible Star Trek future or the Matrix mm -hmm. future or the 1984 future mm -hmm. for a long time. Uh, can you just uh, crystallize what's uh, particularly well, think, different what the, about the analysis you're bringing? One of here? the answers I'd make, I would, I would respond to that is um, someone could have written a book in 1939 about the, 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 the threat from the Nazis and someone said, well, what's new about that? We know about that. You know, it, it, this, this, this stuff's important and, and we, we, gotta, we can't stop talking about it. And what's new about it? Well, just a little bit more recent. I've, I, I wrote about it in 2013 or 2014, whenever it was. Um, things are moving on. So we have to, we have to move on. I've, I've got a better understanding of it now than I did when I wrote about it five or six years ago, how long ago it was. And, um, and hopefully that is reflected in the book. Right. And of the eight scenarios, do you have strong uh, preferences for those which uh, you would like to see come about? Oh, um, yes. So it would be a combination, and I'll, I'll give you the numbers and I'll tell you what they are. It would be a combination of scenario one and scenario six. So scenario one is the sort of Star Trek scenario um, in which, you know, we do have a degree of abundance. Um, look, you know, let's not be over the top about this, but we will be better off than we are at the moment and one of the things I projected in the book we really ought to be aiming at a four-day week you know what's the point in technology if we're going to be working all hours under the sun forever um, and things like you know a more united humanity so that'd be one of the scenarios and the other one isn't not so much a scenario that I necessarily want but it's a scenario we've got to have which is the augmentation we've got to be augmented by technology um, be great if, if, if it wasn't necessary but it's going to have to be, otherwise we will be superfluous. What about scenario eight? Because I, I thought you might have picked that as well. Yeah, the Gaia, the, 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 the Gaia merge, one. partial merging of minds. Uh, yeah, well, the Gaia one ties in with the, um, with the join of the debate thing, really. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's a bit science fiction, that one, really. It's the, um, is it, I can't remember his name. Is it Neil Bostock, the, uh, the Oxford philosopher nick bostrom nick bostrom thank you <laughs> yep i got one of the initial i got i almost got the initials you, you, right you got the initials right yes yeah. nick bostrom. <laughs> um and he was talking about this idea that um 
you know, our brain starts forming, forming synapses with neurons in somebody else's brain or, or artificial synapses. Oh, that's quite scary stuff, isn't it? I don't think that's necessarily a, a viable thing in the next 20 years, but that could happen this century. Um, and I think also augmented reality, I'm sure you're familiar with him. Um, the anthropologist Robin Dunbar believes that we're de designed to live in communities of 150 or 148 actually. Uh, it's the Dunbar number. We're not supposed to, it's supposed to be the cognitive limit to how many people we can have interaction with. Um, and I don't know about you, but I go to networking events and I get chatting to people and and sometimes 10 minutes into the conversation thing i've spoken to this guy before you know i mean how many times have i met people whom i've met before and forgotten you know countless times because i don't think i think there's something in the dunbar number i think there is something in that and what technology can do what ai can do is it can support us it can it can, it can act as a kind of almost like almost like an extension of the brain and say oh that guy there yeah you spoke to him four years ago um uh, this is what you talked about. And, and I think that could extend the Dunbar number. It means that 148 is no longer the cognitive limit to how many people we can have interactions with. Um, I don't know what the cognitive limit would be, but it would be more than 148. And I suppose that does take us slightly towards that sort of Gaia type scenario. Well, you're talking here about technology augmenting our inborn abilities. Uh, I'll give the last question as, uh, to Margaret Hardy. It sort of follows on from this. Uh, it talks about our attitude towards these big tech companies that might be providing us this mm. kind of augmentation. Mm. Margaret actually has quite a long question, but I think it uh, touches on a point or two that you may want to respond to. She refers to the Singularity University and mm -hmm. to Ray Kurzweil, mm -hmm. who of course is a great popularizer of the idea of exponential change. I mean, mm. he influenced me greatly, some of his writings mm. over the years. Mm. He says that the way to make real progress is to harness entrepreneurial desire, to encourage people to find a problem that affects a billion people and solve it. And that's the best way to make a billion dollars. But nowadays, uh, the companies behind Singularity University, the big tech companies, I mean, Google famously were funding it for quite a while, mm. no longer quite as friendly towards them. And they, no, and they no much, longer, I don't think their mission is any longer, don't do evil, is it? I don't think, I don't think they say that anymore. Yeah, so mm. what's your view as to the role of big tech companies or the other a billion dollar pursuing entrepreneurs as being part of the solutions that you're talking about. Yeah, Are yeah. you a flag waver enthusiast for that? Well, one of the, the jobs that I do is I do, I, I write, do quite a lot of investment writing and I've been mm. raving about the big techs for as many, for many, many years. Um, and I was, you know, I was an Apple, Google, Facebook, um, et cetera. Um, been very hot on them for as long as long as I've been writing about it, really. How do I feel about it? Um, SO was broken up. How long ago was SO broken up? 100 years ago? Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that happens with the text. I think ultimately they might have to be broken up because it's not healthy to have a... Uh, and we seem to be heading towards uh, monopolies uh, that don't seem to be breakable. And... The economist Joseph Schumpeter says that great ways of created destruction breaks up monopolies. That, that the new new generation innovate, of innovators come along with new ideas that the and the monopolies haven't thought of. Um, but these new techs they're savvy to that. They understand that the, this whole idea of embracing startups. You know the. <laughs> If you're, if you're an entrepreneur and you've, got this, and you've got this idea for a startup, then probably at the back of your mind is, well, Google might buy me out. Um, um, and that's not healthy. Um, so I think ultimately, probably their power will have to be clipped. Many thanks, uh, Michael. I'll give you a chance to make any final comments that you want in a minute. You've, you've done a great job answering I think literally dozens of questions. I will just mention to everybody watching that London Futurists will be back with an online event on Saturday the 7th of November. This time we are in the afternoon, UK time from 4 p.m., which the speaker is another author, Deborah McKenzie, 
who has written about COVID. Uh, she's been writing about COVID and pandemics for at least 30 years, and she was one of the first to identify COVID as a threat to global uh, uh, destruct, dis, uh, devastation. And she writes in her book about uh, the possibilities of worse pandemics to come, including something that uh, Michael has mentioned, the risk of uh, bacteria that are resistant to the current treatments, and talks about uh, possibilities of pandemics getting worse in the future. So the title of that event is Anticipating a New Black Death. And we're going to look not just at the medical science, but at society's preparedness for the kinds of challenges ahead, of which the kind of discussion we've been having today is certainly setting the scene. So you'll find that online and I encourage you to register. Michael, uh, is there anything you'd like to emphasize in the closing minutes in terms of things that uh, you want people to have in their minds? Not an awful lot other than to say I would agree what you just what the sentiments of the book that you just discussed. I think that is a serious issue, and uh, also it's interesting that that's going to be on the seventh of November because that's my birthday. So I just sort of meant to put that out there. <laughs> um, buy the book <laughs> if you if you're interested in um, discussing this with me further. Um, please contact me. Um, if you're interested in working with me with Techopia, please contact me. Um, can I give my email address out or, or shall we just say contact me on, look me up on LinkedIn? I'm not difficult to find. Not difficult to find. Yeah, by all means, uh, put your, uh, if you want to share your email, well, I can put it in the meetup afterwards. Well, it's not a difficult email either. It's michael.baxter at techopia.co. Uh, the difficult bit is the techopia.co. Yeah, T-E-C-H-O-P-I-A. It's, a, it's, it's, it's dystopia and utopia put together. And, dystopia uh, and utopia. Uh, well, if you Google techopia, it'll come up anyway. And it's .co, not .co.uk, not .com, .co. And you really do believe in the possibility of utopias? Um, yeah, I mean, why not? I mean, um, I have, my daughter had a child recently. I've become a grandfather. And uh, uh, I guess my motivation is it'd be great for her, wouldn't it, for my granddaughter? Well, uh, my son had a, a son recently. He is now three and a half weeks old, and uh, my view of the future has changed. For many years, I used to say, hey, the future used to be what's going to happen to your grandchildren, but the future's coming a lot sooner. Now that I've become a grandparent, uh, suddenly thinking about the future in a slightly different way. Indeed. I look forward to seeing him grow up and look forward in due course to meeting his grandchildren. That's my uh, kind of uh, utopian vision. But Indeed. Anyway, Thank you so much, uh, Michael Baxter. Please, Thank you very much. Uh, people can find uh, Living in the Age of the Jerk online. And uh, by all means, leave reviews and uh, join the discussion online. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.